I do hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, we kind of hung out at home. My wife cooked like all of y'all was coming over. She's just used to cooking that way. I mean, she just know she just used to cooking that way. We had a great time with our son Tyler. He came over and hung out uh, with us most of the day, and uh, my wife put him to work fixing stuff in the house because she wanted to keep him around longer. Uh, but we had a great time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 31 reads as follows. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much more worse punishment do you suppose will be brought be thought worthy of, of who, those who have trampled on the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You may be seated. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you so much for this privilege that it is. We are thankful for our salvation first and foremost. We are thankful for our sanctification. And we are thankful for eventual glorification that is yet to come. We are thankful that you loved us, Heavenly Father, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That Jesus was the once for all sacrifice who atoned for our sins and satisfied your wrath. There is no replacement for him. There is no one who can step in for him past, present, or future. Help us to see Christ this morning. Help us to exalt him to his rightful place in our lives. Help us to put all our trust, our weight, our hope, our dreams, our passions, in him and on him, for he is worthy. Speak to us this morning from your word. Shape us and mold us into the image of Christ, and we will give you all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Let every heart say amen. Well, Friday, we uh, got together with a group of us, and Sister McKee has been looking forward to how I was going to use this. We went to see uh, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Now, don't throw stones at your pastor. I, I do like to get together with the saints and show that I'm human just like the rest of you. I don't fly around all week long with angel wings, with <laughs> angels' trumpets blowing. You can, as a believer, enjoy the talents and abilities God has given other people. But don't ever put your mind on hold. Don't ever leave your Bible at home and don't take it with you when you go to enjoy these things. So while we're sitting there watching the movie, I'm thinking theological. I'm enjoying the sh I didn't enjoy the profanity. I never enjoyed the profanity. But I, I enjoy the storyline, and I really appreciate how they eulogize and show the appreciation for Chad Bozeman, who played the Black Panther. Very well written into the script of how they took what happened to him and applied it to the character he played as the Black Panther. 
For those of you who don't know what the story is about, spoiler alert, the Black Panther dies. The king of Wakanda dies. And they have a processional and they have a funeral and they celebrate his life and his story. But the king has died. But not only has the king has died, the king who played the role of the Black Panther, the protector of Wakanda, has also died, and now Wakanda is without a protector. And while the movie was entertaining, there were some things that provoked my spirit. The view of the afterlife is very pagan. It's not biblical. You don't go to meet the fathers. You don't take a drug and then have an out-of-body experience to talk to people who are dead and gone. And while they did a great job of celebrating the king of Wakanda, the major difference is we have a king that's not dead. We have a king that rose from the dead. And he is the protector of his body, the church. And he is the protector of his people. And I don't have to have out-of-body experiences to talk to him. I don't have to have out-of-body experience to have fellowship with him. He abides in me and I abide in him. And that's where the movie breaks down. But just like the movie provides other means of what we would call salvation, other means of communicating with God, we know that the Bible teaches there's only one way and one way only, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are not all kinds of other ways. See, that's the danger. They're providing another way of looking at life and the afterlife. They're providing other gods. They're providing, they're providing other views of eterni etern eternity and eternal life. See, in their paganism, they believe that the fathers and the mothers will live forever. That their presence is with you forever. That's paganism. We don't serve a pagan god. We serve the living God. We serve the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is our protector. He is our provider. He is our provision. So while you're enjoying the movies, don't leave your theology at home. Because they are trying to teach you something about how you are to view life. And we need to make sure that what they're teaching us doesn't contradict what the Word of God says. Now, I know some of you have been struggling with this concept that we find in Hebrews chapter 6, because I've listened to your conversations. And I understand your struggle. Because if you're like me, you have loved ones that you're holding out hope for that they're still hope for. You don't really want to believe Hebrews chapter 6. Let's, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 6 and then come forward so you know what I'm talking about. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. And I believe chapter 10 helps us to understand Hebrews chapter 6. That's why I'm taking you back there. Verse 4 of chapter 6 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the ages to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Now tell the truth, Shemdel. Some of you got a problem with that. Some of you got a problem with the fact that the all-knowing God would say something's impossible. 
Sis got it. I'm waiting on the rest of y'all to catch up. If God says something's impossible, it's impossible. But sometimes our emotions and feelings, our love for our loved ones, get in the way. And we want to say, well, maybe God missed something. See, your argument is never with your pastor. If your pastor is teaching you the word of God, your argument is always with the word of God. And the Bible says, the divinely inspired, breathed out word of God says that a person can reach a point where it's impossible to renew them to faith. Because men's hearts are wicked. Desperately wicked, Jeremiah says. But the fact that we don't serve a pagan God, we serve a God who knows everything, knows when a heart has gotten too hard. You have a God who knows everything. Beginning, middle, and end. He's seen it all before. See, you're not putting the sermons together. You're, you're feeling. And I understand your feelings, but your feelings don't determine what is true. We have an illustration, and I shared the illustration with you. That's why I started in Joshua when we started this series on courageous faith in stressful time or courage in stressful times we started with the children of Israel who for 40 years refused to believe God but you don't think people you know his heart can be that hard to where 2 million to 6 million people died in the wilderness because they didn't believe God and we don't think that can happen today. None of the people except for three who left Egypt went into the land. Let that simmer for a little bit. And really it was two, but I say three because I include Joseph. Joseph. Who said, take my bones into the land. See, some of y'all thought I was tripping, didn't you? Because some of you know your Bible, and it was only Caleb and Joshua, but you forgot about Joe. Amen. Only three out of two, see, the numbers are mind-boggling. Out of two million plus people went into the land because they did not believe God. But if you read the Bible and you read your, God told you they wasn't going. God told you the people's hearts would become so hard, they wouldn't even hear my voice anymore. And people's hearts can be that hard today. Now, now listen now. We said, well, that can't happen to Christians. It can't happen to people who are pretending. To be Christians. Listen, I believe in eternal security. I believe if you save, you can never be unsaved. Because the one who saves you is the one who seals you. I believe all that. I preach all that. I teach all that. Some of y'all told me Wednesday night I preach and teach that. But I also believe that there are a lot of pretenders who are not contenders. There are a lot of goats mixed in with the sheep. There are a lot of tares mixed in with the wheat. There are a lot of Judases hanging out in the group who have yet to be revealed that they never belong to God. But they're mixed in. And you all, because of your feelings, most of them want to be fooled by the mixed-in folk. 
not realizing some are just pretenders. They're professors, but they're not possessors of new life in Jesus Christ. They mouth all the words, they say all the prayers, they attend church in the Bible studies, they, 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 they walk the aisle, they get dunked in the water, they even hold positions in the church. But they're lost in church. And believe me, I'm with you, that's a difficult thing to deal with. Especially when they're your blood. But I'm not here to preach your emotions. I'm not here to stroke your emotions or your egos. I'm here to tell you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And just like in Israel, there were people who were Jews, descendants of Abraham, they were not children of God. had all the benefits of being a part of the nation, but none of the reality of new birth. Is anybody with me this morning? Amen. So when God says it's impossible to renew them to faith in Christ, once they have been enlightened, once they have become partakers of the work of the Holy Spirit, once they have become partakers of the word of God, once the light has been turned on so that they can see that they are a sinner and that they're in need of a savior and that Jesus Christ is a sinner, and they reject that. God says, if they reject that and they keep rejecting that and they die in that, it's impossible to renew them. Did you catch that? They reject that. They keep on rejecting that. They die in a rejection. You don't go on what they said. You go on the evidence of how they lived. He says here in verse, back in our text, verse chapter 10, verse 26, for if we sin willfully. Now, here's the first question you got to ask. What is the sin that he's talking about sinning willfully? Now, all sin is an affront to a holy God. But I believe this text means something specific, and I think I've proven that over the last five, six sermons. Well, what is the sin that a person can willfully go on sinning that can lead them to being judged by God. Everybody with me now? Everybody up to date? I know y'all want to make this sins. It ain't sins. How do I know that? Well, I know that from the original languages, of course. But I also know it from the context. You see, chapter 10 deals with the fact that the sacrifices of the Old Testament are not in line with the sacrifice of Christ in the New Testament. That the priests had to go in year after year and offer sacrifices over and over again, but Jesus, the New Testament high priest, went in and offered his life as a sacrifice one time and sat down and didn't have to offer sacrifices over and over again. So the sin is the rejection of Jesus Christ. Because the Jews, even today, don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and are still trying to live in the Old Testament. But the writer of Hebrews is saying the Old Testament has been done away by the New Covenant and the New Covenant was initiated by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Leave that and come to Christ. But if you reject Christ and hold on to the old, you are in danger of judgment. Your sins are still on you. But your greatest sin that is on you is the rejection of Jesus Christ. 
because he is the atonement. He is the sacrifice. He is the lamb of God that was sacrificed for your sin, and you rejected him, and if you reject him, there is no other solution for your sin problem. Now, if you leave in here and having visitations with the fathers and the mothers in another life, and they don't tell you that, run. We use the word, the biblical word in this context for this sin is apostasy. Apostasy is an intentional falling away, a withdrawal or a defection. It's intentional, it withdraws, and it defects from Jesus Christ. Apostasy is the act of rejecting the gospel and the person and work of Jesus Christ, for which there is no forgiveness or sacrifice sufficient for that act. Listen, the only sin that Jesus' death can atone for is the sin of unbelief. Because you must believe to be saved. Therefore, if you reject him, and he's the only means of your salvation, there is no other, other sacrifice. There's no other means for being saved. And the church has left the message of Christ. The church in America has left the message of Christ. Paul said this, and you're going to see this when we preach through 1 Corinthians next year, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We're talking about everything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. We divided over race stuff. We divided over political stuff. We divided over Black Lives Matter stuff. We divided over Blue Lives Matter stuff. We divided over Democrats, Republicans. Nobody talking about Christ anymore. Because Christ is a dividing line. Apostasy is not new. The Israelites committed apostasy in the Old Testament, as you will see as we go through these notes. Nor has God's attitude toward it changed. It is the most serious of all sins. Hear me now on this. Apostasy is the most serious of all sins because it is the only sin that the blood of Christ does not atone for. Because you must believe to be saved. You are saved by faith through grace and faith through grace in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. But if you reject Christ, how do you get saved? Because it is the most deliberate and willful form of unbelief. It is not a sin of ignorance, but it is a purposely rejecting known truth. People are not ignorant. They hear truth Sunday after Sunday. They sit in churches Sunday after Sunday. They watch TV Sunday after Sunday, week after week. They hear truth. They hear truth, and they reject it. They are not ignorant. They just don't want it. Let me tell you something about God. He's going to make sure you're going to run into some truth. The Holy Spirit is going to do its work as we will see. People are not rejecting him out of ignorance. They don't need more information. They need to bow down to the information God has revealed. What are the causes of apostasy in this introduction? Persecution is a cause. People don't want to suffer. So they reject Christ because they don't want to suffer. Secondly, false teachers. False teachers not teaching the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number three, temptation. Satan is constantly tempting us. Our flesh is constantly being lured by temptation. And it leads us into apostasy. Falling away. Withdrawal or defection. Neglect. Will you neglect the spiritual disciplines of Bible study and prayer and fellowship and the communion table and baptism and gathering together as brothers and sisters in Christ so you can be exhorted and encouraged to keep on keeping on? 
So you don't end up drifting. You don't end up hard-hearted. You don't end up dull of hearing. You don't end up refusing to hear and listen to the word of God. Fifthly, clinging to the world. We love us in world, don't we? But you remember the parable of the sower. It was the cares of the world that causes people to what? Drift away. Fifthly, forsaking Christian fellowship. When people begin to forsake Christian fellowship, gathering together, assembling together, apostasy is not far down the road. When you get home, read verses 19 to 25 again. He talks about holding fast to something. Hold fast to your confession. How are you holding fast to your confession and you're drifting away? How are you holding fast to your confession for dear life and becoming dull of hearing? You are drifting. You're becoming dull of hearing. You have become hard of heart. You have done all the other things we're talking about because you haven't held fast to what you're supposed to hold fast to. Let me run it through real quick. Verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. You don't need the priest anymore. You can come directly to him because now you're a priest. He says in verse 22, do what? Let us draw what? Now, if you're drawing near, you can't be what? Drifting. You see how this all connects together? We're drifting because we're not drawing near. With a true heart. You can't just draw near. You just can't be in church. Many of you are here, but you're not here. You didn't come with an ear to hear. You didn't do any preparation to come before the Lord today. You didn't deal with any sins before you got here. You didn't deal with any attitudes before you got here. You neglected him all week, and then you show up like Johnny on the spot and say, here I am, Lord. You should be highly favored and blessed that I'm here. Verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You won't waver too far. If you hold in fast. If the boat is tied to the dock, it can only drift so far. But if it ain't tied, it'll be out in the middle of the ocean pretty soon. Because the currents will what? Take it where it don't want to go. You know why you're going where you don't want to go? Because you ain't holding fast. And the devil wants to get you to drift. The devil wants you to be dull of hearing. The devil, the world, the world wants to feed you stuff that is contrary to the word of God. Because even the world knows you can't have a mixed diet. Well, I do protein and no fats on Monday, but then I'm a glutton Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Then I step on the scale Sunday, why my weight ain't going down? Verse 24, and let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. Let us consider. You know who we considering? Me, myself, and mine. Y'all M&Ms don't even know it. Me, myself, and mine. I don't feel like going to church. Well, but what about the others? who need the gift and need the skill or need the encouragement, who need the exhortation that you can provide. How about going for them? Oh, verse 25, not forsaken. The assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Some of y'all, see, he knew about church folk in the 21st century. Why? Because Israel forsook the gathering together. 
The new covenant does not protect you from drifting. It provides everything you need so you don't drift. But if you don't apply, you'll drift just like everybody else does. You'll become dull of hearing just like anybody else does. Saved and totally tuned out. Saved and in the middle of the world being tossed to and fro. Save heart, heart as a rock. And the only way to keep from any of that is verses 19 through 25. But there are people in the church who are not the real deal. They're among us, but they are not of us. And that's the group of people he wants to talk to in our section for today. There are four points I want to make this morning, four aspects of deliberate sin of apostasy. We'll run through them and then we'll get out of here. First is the premise of the deliberate sin of apostasy, verse 26 and 27. The principle of the deliberate sin of apostasy, verse 28. The problem of deliberate sin of apostasy, verse 29. And the proclamation of deliberate sin of apostasy, verse 30 and 31. The premise, the principle, the problem, and the proclamation. Let's look at this first aspect of deliberate sin of apostasy, the premise of deliberate sin of apostasy. We've already been dealing with this a little bit, so we'll just run through this. Christians who claim to be sinless are deceiving themselves. Listen, as a Christian, you are not sinless, but you should sin less. And if you don't have a passion, a desire to sin less, you might be sinful because you're not really in. But also we need to understand that we as Christians still have the ability as saints to still commit acts of sin when we don't choose to obey the word of God. But even when we commit an act of sin, we are doing what 1 John says, we confess our sin, and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Confess what you know, and he'll clean up what you don't know. But we rationalize and justify sin. We ain't trying to get clean. Because I'm saved by grace. And so I got my Grace AMT ATM card, and I just pull it out whenever I sin. So I got enough of my account because I got eternal grace that I can use it all the time. You ain't trying to get rid of sin. And it's sad when the pulpit is helping you to justify sin. We don't do that here. But I also want you to understand, none of us are sinlessly perfect either. If you were sinlessly perfect, you would never have to do use 1 John 1 9. And those who commit a sin should not fear that they are outside God's grace. You have a high priest who's, a, who's interceding in your behalf. You always have access to the throne room of God. Don't let anybody tell you me, the devil, the demons, or any other pastor tell you, you can't come before God and confess your sin. You never have to fear, I love this, you never have to fear coming to God with your sin. That's the positive side. And that's real. But the willful sin of unbelief, is unacceptable. The willful sin here is abandoning one's confession altogether of faith in Jesus Christ alone. The seriousness of this premise is indicated by the rejection of the truth. With stubborn intention behind it and the measure of knowledge and alignment, they refuse to submit. You all know people that have grown up in the church, who have grown up in your homes, you have gone after them and said, hey, hey, the way that you're living, the way that you, what you're doing, the way that you're thinking, the way that you're feeling, you're not attending church anymore, you're not a part of the body, you know that's wrong. They're not ignorant. 
They're rejecting what you're saying, and they're rejecting what you're saying because they've rejected Jesus. You all been coming on Wednesday nights, most of you. We've been teaching about making disciples. How are you a disciple rejecting obedience? How are you a Christian and you don't want to obey? How in the world does the world get 70,000, 80,000 people to fill a football stadium when they can all stay home and watch it virtually, but you want to do church virtually? They got three or four TVs in their house. They could do it virtually. Why do they go to the assembly? Because there's something about being present. There's something about rubbing shoulders with others who feel the same way you do about what's happening on the field. There's something about the one another. But yet you all know people who say they say they don't even come to church, don't want to come to church, have no interest in coming to church, don't read their Bible, don't pray, don't study, don't be a part of small groups or anything. Why are you still telling them they saved? When they are willfully sinning by rejecting Jesus Christ. Oh, pastor, they say they believe in Jesus. The demons believe in Jesus. So what? They know better than we know who he is. But the one thing they don't do is follow him and obey him. Now you tell me which one they look like. The demons or the saints? The demons don't obey Jesus. They don't follow him. But you say you belong to Jesus. You don't obey him and you don't follow him. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you'll do what? Say it like you mean. If you love me, you'll what? I'm saved whether I'm keeping him or not. I love Jesus whether I'm keeping him or not. Nobody does it perfectly. You ain't doing it all right. (laughs) You talk like a demon. I'm at least guilty of trying. (laughs) You ain't even trying. You out there in the world doing what the world wants, doing what, the, what your body whatever body wants. You have no self-control. You have no restrictions. Israel did that too, didn't they? How did it end up for them? How did it end up for the two million to six million who didn't obey God? But everybody doesn't leave the assembly either who is guilty of rejecting him. Some of them still come to church. They still come to small groups. They still come to Bible study. They still come to Wednesday night, just like Judas. And they're the sons of perdition and daughters of perdition the whole time. Because they have rejected Christ or they have another view of Christ That is not the view that the Bible teaches. Is anybody with me this morning? Listen to 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's not a saved person. But he wrote this to a young pastor who was the pastor of the church at Ephesus saying that people in your very midst will be guilty of this. Deuteronomy 13, 13 says, Corrupt men have gone out from among you and enticed the inhabitants of their city, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which you have not known. The God of lust, the God of drugs, the God of shacking, the God of living together with somebody you're not married to, the God of immorality, the God of 
drugs, the God of... And there's no repentance on their part. See, the difference is we repent. They go on and they're having fun. Not all of us who are ex-habitual sinners. No, they ain't really having fun. That in the quiet hours, when they're all alone, and that conscience and that spirit is working. It's not so much fun. That's why they got to medicate themselves to quiet the voices. That's why they got to drug themselves to quiet. That's why they got to drink themselves into a stupor to quiet. That's why they got to lay down with somebody to quiet the voices. That, that wrestler, Randy Orton, the viper, has the theme song, I hear voices in my head. You all know when you was steeped in sin. You had just enough Bible in you to be dangerous. But you refused to repent. We all been there. But we also know when God really got a hold of our life, we just went playing church. That all changed. He goes on to say in this verse, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge, that word knowledge is epigenosis in the Greek. It is the word for knowledge it means denotes full knowledge, understanding, discernment. People are not, these people are not ignorant. They've tasted, according to chapter 6 of Hebrews, that the Holy Spirit has convicted them. It, it, they have been enlightened and they reject. They're not ignorant. They are willfully, intentionally rejecting Christ. And no matter how much more information you give them, until they've been changed inwardly by the Holy Spirit, until they've been born again, you can't give them enough information. Because they'll just keep rejecting and rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. Now, if you think you can just go then with your flesh stuff and not be filled with the Spirit, See, see, the problem for some of us, we go into people and we're dealing with severe cases, but we ain't right. Some of you don't know this, but I, I just recently went through some training because I'm always ever learning, probably never getting anywhere. But, but I just went through some training because I was asked to become a certified trainer at the Y. So I had to go through all this training. I had to take six, eight hours of classes online, and then I had to go through CPR training. And, and I'm a real doctor now. <laughs> if you fall out, I can help you. If you cut yourself and you bleed, I know exactly what to do. If you got Alzheimer's, if you're allergic to something, you got asthma, I know all that stuff. Let me tell you something. We had to go in and practice on the dummy. Dead is dead. We did all them 30 compressions and breathed in twice. That dummy was still dead. A lot of dead dummies in the household of God. You feeding them, you pumping them, you breathing in them, and there's no life. We feed them the word of God week after week. We nourish them. We encourage them. We exhort them. We pray for them. No life. Because they're dead. Because if they were alive and there was enough breath in them, the rescue procedures would work.
These people have full understanding and they still reject. They have full knowledge and they still reject. And he says the first result of apostasy is no longer there is a sufficient sacrifice for sin. This is why it's impossible. If you reject Jesus, there's nothing else to save you. This is why it's impossible for them to be renewed. Because what they need, they reject. Now, I must warn you, be careful about quitting on people before their last breath. See, the ideal here is they reject all the way to the point of death and never repent. Therefore, it's impossible. Now, we don't know who those people are. That's why we keep going after them. That's why we keep witnessing. And that's why we keep sharing. But at the same time, if I do the 30 compressions, if I breathe in you twice, and I do the, and you never revive, that's because you're dead. You got to understand both realities. He says there is no longer any sacrifice that is sufficient for them. No longer remains a sacrifice for sin. There is, if Jesus is rejected, there is no other sacrifice that can atone for your sins. Therefore, it's impossible to renew you. It's impossible for you to get saved. Y'all still with me? The second result of apostasy is rejection of Jesus Christ brings greater judgment. Now, here's the part we don't like. Look at this. There's no longer remains a sacrifice of sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. If you reject Jesus, all you got looking forward to you is judgment. And this is why we need to be out there on the highways, in the hedges, in the bushes. Trying to rescue people. Giving them spiritual CPR. Because if they aren't revived and they remain in a rejection, all they got to look forward to is judgment. Stop telling people to rest in peace. No person that's outside of Christ is resting in peace. They in torment. They're in line for severe judgment at the great white throne of judgment. Ain't no resting in peace for the unsaved. They are not at peace. Joel Seen says, your best life is now. If you unsaved, this is it. This is as good as it gets. Because there's nothing waiting for you but what? Judgment. So in a sense, he's right. If you're unsaved, this is your best life. This is, hey, hey, eat, drink, and be merry, the Bible says. Go for the gusto. Get all you can get. Because ain't nothing waiting on you but judgment. Now, if we really believe that, we wouldn't get so distracted by worldly stuff. If we really believe that there's judgment waiting on them, we would do everything that is possible to rescue them. We don't believe that. We believe Black Panther. They're going to go and be with their fathers and their mothers. We believe they'll just cease to exist. There's nothing after this. I got eternal life. They ain't got eternal life. That's their problem. You do not have the heart of Christ if that's your mentality. The principle of deliberate sin of apostasy. Look at verse 28. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law, dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses in the Old Testament. Especially, you can read Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 2 to 7 when you get home, but it basically says if people were found in sin that they were unpent of, they were, if they had two or three witnesses, then they would stone them. That was under the law. Listen, and here's the principle. If under the law, willful sin required death, 
if there's two or three witnesses, how much more when you reject Jesus Christ do you deserve to die in judgment? Did y'all catch that? Listen to Deuteronomy 17, 2 to 7. If there is found among you with any of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you, a man or a woman has been wicked in the sight of the Lord your God and transgressing his covenant, who has gone and served other gods and worshiped them, either the sun, the moon, or any other host of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it is told to you, you hear of it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it is indeed true and certain that such an abomination has been committed in Israel, verse 5, then you shall bring out to your gates the man or woman who has committed that wicked thing and shall stone them to death, that man or woman, with stones. This was under the law of Moses. Wasn't well, putting people in jail 15, 20 years. Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Would our court system not change if we followed this? People going out and shooting up a whole mall and grocery store. 18 million people saw you. And we 15 million years in a trial trying to figure out whether you're guilty or not. That's another sermon for another time. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first against him to put him to death. So the people who witness it and verify it are the first ones to throw the stone. Now here's something you don't know about biblical history. If it was found that you lied and gave false testimony, then you got stoned. How many people do you think was lying? If it was found out you lied or you bared false witness, you got whatever the punishment that person would have got in their place. So it wasn't a whole lot of perjury going on. So you shall put away this evil from among you. We're not trying to deal with evil the way the Bible says we should deal with evil. We're we, we trying to seek vengeance. Like Shuri and Neymar in Black Panther. Because you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. Because you did this to me, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to burn the world. Far from being more tolerant of sin today, God is less tolerant. When's the last time we heard that? We believe God is tolerant of sin because of grace. God is less tolerant of sin because of what he done through his son Jesus Christ on the cross. What it cost him to save you, he's less tolerant. Now, God's always been intolerant of sin. Why? Why is he less? Because men have much more light in the New Testament than they had in the Old Testament under the law of Moses. Listen to Acts 17, 30 and 31. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, talking about the law of Moses under the Old Covenant, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. If you reject Jesus, you are in line for judgment. What is the light? What is this light? What is, what is this more light that we have? I came up with six. We have the light of the scriptures. They had the law of Moses. We got the law of Moses and the New Testament. They had the old covenant. We got the new covenant. We got more light. And if you have more light, then there's more required of you. We have the light of the apostles and the prophets. We have their teachings. We have their writings. We have the light of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would temporarily come and indwell people and empower people in the Old Testament. He now permanently indwells and he regularly fills believers in the New Testament. We have a better covenant, therefore we have more responsibility. Because we have more light. How about the light of the Hall of Fame of Witnesses? 
You know what chapter comes after chapter 10 in Hebrews? Chapter 11. Guess what's in chapter 11? A whole hall of fame of witnesses who lived it by faith. So we in the New Testament have all these Old Testament witnesses, this great cloud of witnesses who live by faith, who were saved by faith. You got more light. How about the light of the miracles, miraculous signs and wonders? How about the light of the inner witness and creation? Romans chapter 1 says everybody knows God exists. They may not know specifically who that God is, but they know their God exists. There's our inner witness. And then you can look at creation and see the wonders of creation and the beauty of creation and the stitching of creation, and that's a witness. We got more light. Therefore, there is a greater punishment for those who have more light than those who had less light. Thirdly, the problem of the deliberate sin of apostasy. Look at verse 29. Of how much more worse punishment, I told you. If that was that kind of punishment under the principle of the Old Testament, the law of Moses, how much greater? So he argues from lesser to greater. Or how much worse punishment do you suppose will be, he be, thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace. Y'all keep playing, all right? Keep playing, church. Keep playing at it. Don't be real. Keep refusing to, to take the light to people who are in the dark. Because the more you know, and the more you understand, and the less you do based on what you know and understand, the greater your punishment. Now, he's talking here about those who reject Christ. But there's some application for us who say we in Christ. It's just as disobedient to be in Christ and not do what Christ says as it is to be outside of Christ and not do what Christ says. And that's why I tell you, this is a dangerous church to come to. Because we're going to teach you what the word means. We're going to help you understand it as best as possible. We're going to try to model it. We're going to try to walk it. But the more light you have, and you do less, the greater your punishment and your judgment. Now, some of you are under the misconception that we as believers won't be judged. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm saved. I'm in. I climbed up the rough side of the mountain. I'm in. I'm good. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me help you out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 9. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Are, 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 you, are you striving to be well-pleasing? Is that the target you're aiming at every day? You may not always hear the bullseye, but you ought to at least be on the target. Don't be hitting the barn door and, uh, and uh, gonna be gonna hit the target at least because you're aiming at it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, whether it has worth or whether it's worthless. Listen, this is past fail. This ain't A, B, C, D, and E. This is past fail. Either it has worth or it's worthless. Everything you do, everything you say, everything you think, either has worth or it's worthless. And you'll have to give an account at the judgment seat. And your rewards will be based on the past failed. Listen to this. 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things which done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If you know this is coming, if you know they're destined for judgment because of the rejection of Christ, are you out there persuading them? Pastor, I pray that people get saved. That's nice. Are you trying to persuade anybody? The Bible says we ought to be begging people to get saved. The Bible says you ought to be commanding people to get saved. We ain't even talking about people being saved. But then we all divide about you getting your shot because you need your shot. You need to get your COVID shot. Would you please get your COVID shot? Don't you know that you getting COVID affects the rest of us? And if you care about other people, you should do what's right and get your shot. But you ain't telling them to get their sin shot. You ain't telling them to get inoculated by the grace of God and by the blood of Jesus Christ. But you out there most marching and protesting about a shot. Why y'all looking at me like that? We're too worldly focused. We're not kingdom focused. We're here for a reason. To witness to people about the mercy and grace of God found in Jesus Christ alone. And if you're not interested in doing that, ask God to take you home today because you are no earthly good. Because witnessing is the only ministry that you have on earth that you won't do in heaven. Therefore, it's the most important thing we do. You'll worship in heaven. You'll get Christian education in heaven. Thank God you'll have a better teacher than me. Well, fellowship in heaven, but there won't be a lost people person you can witness to in heaven. That's on earth. Listen. It is blatant violation of the law given through Moses' warrant the punishment of death. Then do we suppose the rejection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would deserve a less punishment? If the law warranted it, stoning and punishment. You think grace warrants less? Listen, rejection of more light brings a severe judgment. Apostates reject the Father. Look at the verse. They have trampled the Son of God underfoot. The apostates reject the Son of God. Philippians 2 9 says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, meaning Christ, and given him Christ, the name which is above every name. John 10 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. You reject the Father and you reject the Son. Jesus would put it this way in John 14 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes into the Father but by me. You say you got God, but you reject the Son. The Son says, You reject me, you reject the Father. Because the Father and I are. You got people running around, especially Jews, who believe in God. They don't believe in Jesus. They lost. I believe in Jesus. I don't believe there's a God, Father. You lost. It's all or nothing. It's not let's make a deal. Apostates reject the Holy Spirit. Listen to John 16, 8 through 11. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. They're not ignorant. They got all this light. They got all this information. The Holy Spirit is illuminating left and right. They just reject it. Apostates reject the word of God. Now, I can't go to that church. They preach the Bible too much. He's always talking about, look at the Bible. Look at the Bible. 
Look at the text. Look at the text. I just want you to tell me how you feel. They reject the word of God. Apostates reject the human witnesses. Acts 1.8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witness. They don't want to listen to you. But listen, the fact they don't want to listen don't mean we don't tell them. Pastor, I'm trying to talk to folks. Folk ain't listening. I get tired of talking to folk, and they won't listen. You better hope God never says, I'm tired of talking to you because you don't listen. What does the command got to do with how they respond? He told you they ain't going to listen. Well, my little ego and feelings can't handle rejection. Get filled. Because the Holy Spirit don't mind being rejected. Become under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Y'all seen drunk people? You can hit them and they don't feel nothing. They fall down, people walk on them, kick them. They don't feel a thing. Why? Because they feel. The reason you keep feeling what people are doing to you because you ain't filled with the Holy Spirit. The word trample means to have scorn or have counted as worthless. They count Christ as worthless. They count the shedding of his blood as worthless. They count the spirit of grace as a common thing as worthless. But listen to the proclamation of the liberal sin of apostasy. He says this in verse 30, 31, we're almost done. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, in Wakanda, everybody trying to get revenge. You know why Wakanda trying to get revenge? Because that's what we're doing in real life. The Bible says when you reject God's only solution for your sin problem, when you reject God's free gift in the person of his son, you offend him. And vengeance is coming. You spit on him. You count what he gave as a gift in his son. You count the blood that was shed by Jesus on the cross as a worthless thing. Vengeance is coming. Listen, it's not our job as the church to take vengeance on people. God's going to take vengeance. We need to warn them about the vengeance that's coming because of the rejection of Jesus Christ. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And, give you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. It's coming. It's coming. Are you warning people? Are you warning people? Do you even care that vengeance is coming? Because they reject God and they reject, reject the Lord Jesus Christ. They reject his witnesses who are supposed to be witnessing about these things, these truths, these realities. <clears throat> Listen to Matthew, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew 13, 38, 42. The field of the world, the good seeds are sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the son of wicked one. They're all mixed into the world, the field of the world together. The field is not the church. The text says the field is the world. Stop thinking nobody's supposed to be sinning in the world. There are sinners who have been sown into the world by Satan, and there are people of God who's been sown into the world by God, and they live side by side. 
The enemy who sown them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out his kingdom, all the things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Judgment is coming. We see some of it in time. But we don't see the scope of what it's going to be till the end. And if you and I are not warning people, if you and I are not trying to rescue them, as Jude says, from the fire without getting scorched or burned, then we're a part of the problem. We're not a part of the solution. Those who reject the grace and gift of God, there is nothing and there is no one left that God can offer or do to save them. Only judgment remains. This is why you don't want to be playing Christian. This is why you don't want to be playing church. I challenge you to be the real deal. So that you can hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. But for those who reject Christ, there is nothing awaiting them except the judgment of God. Father, we just thank you so much. Your word is eternally true. Sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes we want to change it because we have people we care about and love that we know are in this condition. But rather than changing your word, how about we get about our father's business of seeking and saving that which is lost, of being witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the other most parts of the world, of calling people to be saved, commanding people to be saved, commissioning people to be saved, confronting people to be saved. It is by your power and by your might that we can do any of this. It's because of your grace and mercy you have shown upon us that we've even come to the reality of the truth. We're not any smarter than those people who reject. You just moved on our hearts in such a way that we submitted. We didn't become hard of heart. We didn't become dull of hearing. We didn't drift away. We didn't refuse to hear. We didn't continue to sin, the sin of unbelief, willfully. We're not better than they are. But we do need to be more appreciative than they are. Help us, Father, to be a church that's on a rescue mission. Sharing the good news and the bad news telling them the benefits of responding to the good news and telling them the tragedy of responding, not responding to the bad news. Help us, Father. Fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your word. Fill us with your passion for lost people. And as we do this, we will give you all the glory as we see you change lives, change attitudes, change behaviors, change directions. For you are the almighty God, but so so you are the God who takes vengeance upon those who reject you. We pray this for your glory. In Jesus' wonderful name, let your heart say, amen.